Okay. Have started recording. All right, in the recent past, we reduced the two-body problem with a central potential into first into a one-body problem, and then into a one-dimensional one-body problem. So we simplified it a lot, and we have been able to get some results. In particular, um, we look at the shape of the potential in which you know, this one body moves. Um, what about the shape of that potential? It has a name. It's actually some. British dude. Leonard Jones. Leonard Jones. So, what is special about this potential? It looks a little bit like this. zero at infinity. So here you have a wall, right? It's a potential barrier. Um, in, the, in the case of um, you know, the, the Keplerian problem, uh, what provides this, this energy wall? Centrifugal force, right? So essentially, mm, Maybe this is a good example. You have your axis over here, and over here you have your, your x-axis, right? So this part. But this is actually rotating. So this one is like going you know, into the board and then out of it. And if it is rotating very fast, then the centrifugal force is large. If it is rotating very slow, then it is small. But the fact is that you know, that rotation uh, impedes the two bodies just colliding against each other. So this is the, the, the wall part of the potential. And then you also have this other part, right? So it looks a little bit like this. The other one. Uh, one looks like this. So it is proportional to 1 over r squared, and this one is proportional to 1 over r. What provides this potential? Gravity. So gravity is trying to pull these bodies together, but the fact that they are rotating um, 
um, makes them impossible to collect. So, you know, they're going to be um, rotating against each other, I guess, again, against their center of gravity um, pretty much forever. So we saw that um, if the total energy is, you know, larger than zero or approximately zero, uh, approximately zero, greater than zero, then the body is unbound, or the system is unbound, and uh, actually what you will get um, upon closest approach will be something that looks like that, right? So it will be a hyperbola. And um, if it is less than zero, then the system is bound, and it's going to be oscillating between Let's say that the energy is over here. It's going to be oscillating between R negative, or well, I'm going to call it R minus, and R plus. So you're going to have two radii. Um, these are circles, actually. So this will be R plus. And this one will be R minus. And the, you know, the energy, potential energy will be minimum here. So this will be the kinetic energy maximum. This will be the potential energy maximum. The kinetic energy here will be zero. So these are the turning points, just like you learn in, in your intro mechanics. And so you have this continuous change between kinetic energy and potential energy. That changes the radius. And so a system that has, that is bound, but it's not over here, is going to look like this. Um, should you go to the new one? Can I do it now? Let's see, like that, and like this, and so on. So the fact <coughs> is that um, you're going to have something that looks elliptical, but it has a precession, just like a top. So one of the famous precessions is the precession of Mercury, because uh, it shows that um, um, that general relativity was correct, right? You could not account with classical mechanics for the precession of, of Mercury. But um, pretty much everything in the universe is going to have a precession. So it looks like this. You have an ellipse, and then the next orbit is going to be shifted a little bit, the next one is going to be shifted a little bit, and so on. What is the period of precession of the Earth? Twenty six thousand years. So every twenty six thousand years, it goes back to its original ellipse, and that of course has uh, pretty big implications for uh, for the, for climate because depending on what part of the cycle, 26,000 year cycle, uh, the Earth is, you know, the winters and uh, the summers might be harsher. So um, almost everything is going to have a precession like that, except when you're over here. When you're over here, the system essentially has no extra kinetic energy and it is going to trace a perfect circle. You can see that in um, in uh, binary pulsars, right? So binary pulsars are rotating uh, fast enough that they disperse enough energy as gravitational waves, so they lose the kin their kinetic energy little by little until they reach this point. Eventually they collide, you know, they form uh, supernovas, I, I 
in type two, and um, you know they create um, gold and heavy elements like that. It's kind of uh, good stuff. Um, I also told you that in the case of materials, this case corresponds to um, gases. This will be this will close will be like a liquid. Over here. Um, it will be a, a solid that can expand to accommodate the extra kinetic energy, in this case heat. There are um, some materials that have, um, that have a weird shape for the potential. It looks, it will look it will look like this for whatever reason, you know, some electronic structure effect. So in this case, it is easier to go to this side than to this side, and the, ma the material will have negative thermal expansion. Um, I have not seen anything that resembles this for uh, orbits, but um, I've thought about, you know, setting up some, um, what do you call it? Like a genetic algorithm uh, or some sort of search algorithm that will find a potential that looks like this for orbits. Um, I guess it will mean that, you know, I don't know exactly what it will mean. Be What's that? Isn't it like a potential well? A poten it is in a potential well, but the fact that it's easier to become smaller than to become larger is the opposite of what we see in orbits. So uh, or, uh, the fact that orbits do this means that they are elliptical. So to accommodate the extra kinetic energy, they become more and more elliptical. But I've never seen this um, for, uh, for orbits. Probably doesn't exist, but still, it would be nice to look for it. Um, okay. So yeah, a lot of stuff here. Good stuff. I like it. Um, so let's look at the virial theorem. What is a virial theorem? Have you heard about it? What is it, Omero? To analyze um, system of two or more particles? Yeah, for sure. What does it do? What is the relationship? I don't know. Yeah, that's right. Um, it has another caveat. And the caveat is that it is a time average, it's not necessarily instantaneous. So, if we have a system of particles, I'm going to draw it, why not? And we will have a position R for each one of them. You know, R1, R2, these are vectors, R3, and so on. And they feel a force, and this force could be, you know, maybe just their combined gravitational interaction. Uh, it could be um, Coulomb attraction or repulsion. You know, any, um, actually it could be any kind of, uh, of potential, but uh, in this particular case, we're going to focus on the central potential. So they're going to feel uh, a force, and then we have that the change in momentum is going to be the force felt by that particular particle. So you know, this is the Newtonian equation of motion. and. So we're going to focus on this quantity, 
is because it is going to give us what we want. It's called G, and it is the sum over all the particles of the momentum dot the, uh, the, the position vector. So the derivative of this quantity, the time derivative, is going to be dg dt, and it's just sum over all particles, mi, ri, dot, which is the, the momentum, um, dot, ri, and we have a dt over here, so we can just put it as a dot. So, this will be u and this will be v. So this one is uh, u dv. So we need also v dv. So v dv is um, sum over all the particles r i vector dot m i r i dot and we have a dt so we can put it here as another dot so dg dt is equal to the sum over all the particles and this one is mi ri dot square so that's the kinetic energy and this is you know, this is a dot product so we can uh, it commutes so we can just rewrite this one as ri um, well actually fi well whatever it's, the order doesn't matter in this case But if you write it this way, um, it's a little bit easier to see. Um, this is the force, right? It's a little bit easier to see that that is the, the work. So the potential energy. So this one is going to be twice the kinetic energy because we're missing the one half. And then this is the it's going to be the potential energy. So in general you know, at any particular instant, the value of t and the value of uh, the other term, the potential, is going to be different. But if energy is conserved, uh, what is dg dt? Zero. Zero. It will be conservation of energy. So we get that. Um, well, actually, let me be a little bit more rigorous. The the integral of this thing with respect to time from zero to tau, where tau is the period, divided by the period. This one is zero. Okay. So what we're seeing here is um, 
you might have the kinetic energy, you would say that it moves kind of like that. This is tau one period. And so the kinetic, twice the kinetic, so let's say that the original one is here. So then the potential energy is going to be you know, whatever you need to fill this one. So it could be something like this. So the sum, well actually, I guess it could be more like this. But this one is DGDT. So the value of DGDT of this integral, um, you know, we can just get rid of these DTs, and then this is just the integral of DG. So we can, um, and it is. Um, how do you call this one? <laughs> It has integration limits. Sorry, I forget words. An integral that has integration limits. Definite. Definite, thank you. <laughs> um, so then this one will be G of tau minus G of zero. Um, divided by tau. So this is one is going to be zero because by definition zero and tau are the same point and they go back. So this one is zero. Um, at any particular instant this, you know, this whole thing with the zero doesn't necessarily hold. But over a time period, so in particular, you know, one cycle, this is going to be true. It doesn't have to be periodic. Um, there's one way to, to, to cheat your way into getting this again. So maybe and maybe the this function looks like this, right? So over here you are at g of zero. You just have to find a time. You, know, you just have to sit down and wait for a while just have to find a time in which I guess I didn't wait enough in which the function goes back to the value that it had at G0 and if you have a system well, I guess I erased it but that is oscillating like you know almost everything that you're going to have um, in the universe then at some point it is going to have the same value for g. So you just say, oh, here's my g tau, and then this is valid. And you just divide by this, uh, this time tau. So it definitely works in the case of periodic motion. Um, but if you think about it, everything is periodic and in the worst case scenario the period is infinity if it 
never repeats in the history of the universe. But very likely it's going to have the same value in a time that is much smaller than the age of the universe. Okay, so we have this stuff. Um, this means that if we design this, uh, this classroom with no sense of mechanics, huh? Maybe they, they did. Um, so this is a time average, and this one is a time average also. So, um, I guess you can write it in several forms. Uh, one way will be sum over all the particles of fi dot ri time average is equal to um, usually you have the one half over here and this is equal to the time average of the kinetic energy Easy peasy, right? This is called the Burial Theorem. It is, um, it is widely used. It is powerful because it assumes very little. So that means that it's going to apply in many situations. You know, Einstein said that you should judge a theory how good it is by how, um, I guess, relaxed the axioms are and so how wide it's, how wide it's the uh, applicability. And if you think in those terms, this is, this is, a, this is very powerful. So one of the first uses was derive um, if you assume that you have a, an ideal gas what is an ideal gas what are the properties of an ideal gas what about a normal gas that is not an ideal An ideal gas has, um, the particles have no volume and no interaction. So if you fill a box with an ideal gas, the gas particles are never going to interact. Their only interaction is going to be with the box. So pressure, is force is dp is uh, force divided by area and it is pressure okay. so p dA is equal to d force um, here the direction of the force is perpendicular to the box um, and negative because it is um, against the particle trying to escape. Uh, so this is going to be PDA uh, in the direction of negative N. So if you plug this one in here, you're going to get. Um, Here. 
minus p over 2, so that one, the negative and the 2. Uh, integral n dot r dA, and that's equal to um, where is it? Mm. Yes. Um, let's write it down. Negative p two, p over two, divided by the. Divergence of R dB. This is um, Stokes theorem. So this is equal to minus P over 2, and this is just 3D. The divergence of R, you have 1.4 each direction. And then you integrate, so you have your the whole thing. So you can rearrange this, it will be negative 3 halves PD, and it's this side of the equation. What will be the kinetic energy? Yeah, you took my thermal class. Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to be three halves number of particles, uh, Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. Right. It's the kinetic energy of a uh, of a system of particles. So. You know, this law, you, this equation, you probably saw it in um, maybe middle school, right? So, PB equals NKDT. Maybe you saw it with uh, like the small n and r, um, the gas constant. So it's a well-known um, law for ideal gases. Um, so that comes directly from a theorem in, in classical mechanics. There's no, there's no quantum in here. Um, there's this cool um, phenomena I'm gonna just mention briefly, and I will probably um, have a, a problem about it in the homework. Star clusters, and clusters of stars, they're called um, globular clusters, in which you have a bunch of stars over here in the center, and then the density of stars decreases outside. So you have kind of distinct regions. The, the cluster is bound gravitationally. So what can we say about the energy, the total energy? It's 
negative. Does that make sense? So you have your, just like before, you have your potential. Um, if they are bound, then your energy is over here, which is less than zero. So the total energy is going to be um, I guess it's going to be twice the kinetic energy plus this one, plus the potential, let's call it T. Is that right? No, no. It's just T plus V. So the time average, um, I can put it over here, is going to be the consequence of these uh, system is that when you in increase the total energy, so when you add energy to the system, the energy becomes more negative. So the um, how do you call this quantity? Sorry, my memory is kind of bad today. You add heat uh, to a system and the temperature increases by so much heat capacity. So the heat capacity of the system is negative. So um, at least there's going to be a region inside that has that property, negative heat capacity. So when you add energy to the system, it could be you know, like a, a comet or something, I don't know. Um, this region is going to become smaller because that is how it can accommodate that energy. And so this uh, potential will become uh, narrower and deeper. And so for the same energy will be like over here and over here. And this region, uh, the outside region, is going to expand because the stars are over here, so the way they accommodate the extra energy is by increasing their kinetic energy. So eventually, um, these stars that are outside might escape. They will be an evaporation. They will evaporate, and these ones will become, you know, more and more uh, tightly bound. So this effect is called the uh, Gravo thermal collapse. Again, it's a pretty general uh, effect. If you have, you know, there are even galaxies that look just like like uh, globular clusters. So as they gain more energy, for whatever reason, the center, the core becomes smaller and smaller, and the outside becomes bigger and bigger. Uh, if it happens very quickly, uh, then these stars will just escape 
this one will become very tightly bound. What is, uh, or I guess, is there a phenomenon that impedes the total collapse of the core? Let's say, you know, for it to just form like a humongous black hole. So is there a way for these stars in the core to accommodate the kinetic energy without um, you know, becoming all of it um, just like super tightly bound like this and having like a black hole down here? Well, the answer is yes. Most of these stars are going to be in, uh, in uh, they're, they're gonna be binary systems. So they're gonna be rotating around their center um, of, of mass. And so they're going to have a barrier like this one, impeding them for, from using um, all the kinetic energy. So that's a cool effect. Okay, so now it's going to talk about um, Keplerian orbits a little bit. Do you guys think in in words or in pictures or in something else? I think mostly in pictures. So, like, I have to describe what I'm seeing, and so that's why I forget words. I don't forget relationships, but I forget words. Anyways, think about it next time you're thinking. It's difficult. Uh, we derived this equation. show that at this in principle we can separate the time <coughs> and the um, and the distance it's not the distance the, the well I guess the distance between the bodies the spatial part and the temporal part so we can get something like this integral of dt is plus or minus, I guess we have the square root integral of this one, right? So we can get r as a function of t and from the angular momentum, and I guess also from the, or just from, from the angular momentum part, we can get a theta um, component. So we can also get theta as a function of time. So this will be like a parametric equation, right, in time. We can also get R as a function of theta, since we have these two equations. 
when you um, reduce your system to an equation that looks like this, it's called reduced to quadrature. I have to, thank you so much. I have to read more about the origin of that term. Um, I don't know when it was um, became popular, but it essentially means that you have almost the problem, like it's almost complete. You just have to solve the integral. So you got it to the last step. The last step is to solve the integral. You can solve the integral analytically sometimes. Um, Typically, you can solve it numerically. So, because back in the day it was not the case, but now if you get an integral, you can just you know, plug it into Mathematica or something, and you can get a solution even if it's numerical. So reduced to quadrature means that you get these integrals. Um, so let's consider a potential, this is what we want to get. So let's consider a Keplerian. Um, so I guess inverse square law potential. That'd be k divided by r. And it's the one that we used last time also. Uh, the equation that we got was this one, m r double dot minus l squared m r cube equals uh, a force, which was a function of r. So this force is minus dv dr. And so dv dr will be in this case um, a k divided by r squared. So when we put it over here, we get. Um, MR double dot equals uh, this one minus K over R squared. So I am, oh yeah, this one was negative, so it goes to the other side, it's positive. So L was a constant, if you remember, it was the angular momentum. So it was equal to mr squared um, theta dot squared. Yeah, right? It's not missing a squared here. dot squared equals L squared over M squared R four.
Okay. Don't worry about that. Yes. Um, so we can take the, uh, the time derivative. So this will This means that d theta is um, L and L squared over MR squared dt. So we can have this operator, so it's going to be The derivative of a quantity with respect to time is L divided by MR squared derivative with respect to theta. We move this one over here and this one over here. And this is our, our um, differential operator. If we let u be 1 over r du over e theta and this is uh, from the chain rule it's going to be the derivative with respect to theta of 1 over r which is a function of theta so it's going to be derivative with respect to r of 1 over r dr d theta so we get that du d theta. Again, this is going to be like a differential operator. <clears throat> it's 1 over r squared dr d theta. So we have this one, we have this one, we have this one. And we are going to um, rewrite this one over here. We have that mr dot dot is L squared divided by mr cubed minus k over r squared. So it's just that equation over there. So this is m, and then this is the derivative with respect to time of the derivative of r with respect to time. So this is m, same m over here. Um, we have this operator um, out here, so it's going to be L over MR squared derivative with respect to theta. And then we have this one over here. Um, so that one is going to be This one, so the u we're going to replace it with um, with r. It's a differential. So it's going to be um, r.
comes from these boundaries. So if you put the dr over here, so dr is dt, it's l over nr squared dr d theta, which is this one. Okay. So now that makes sense. So we're just using this differential operator twice. Um, so this one, over here, is du d theta. is going to be equal to L squared over MR cubed minus K over R squared. We can cancel this M with this M and we can um, cancel this M with this M if we put an M over here. All right, so now this looks like L U squared, so this one over here, one over R, and then we have uh, the derivative with respect to theta of minus L uh, du d theta equals L squared u cubed, so this one, minus k um, u squared m. We can get rid of the u squareds, so like this one, this one, and over here we end up with only one u. So this one's gonna be minus um, L squared divided by L squared um, second derivative of u with respect to theta squared. And for this one we use uh, this one again, so we got the uh, other L. So it's gonna be L squared U divided by L squared minus KM divided by L squared. We divided everything by um, L squared, so we can get rid of this one, this one, and we have that one only. So this one, I'm gonna put it over here, is d squared u d theta squared. We have the negative initially. We can move the u over here. And we have still that negative, km over l squared. We have negative, 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 so we can just get rid of them. Make all of them positive. And This one, I did it a little bit different, but 